it's rich. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm coming from JISC. I don't know how many of you have encountered JISC before. <coughs> yeah, so quite a few of you. For those of you who don't, we're a charity that are owned by you lot. Um, we provide shared services, so things like the Janet Network. Um, we do deals on behalf of the sector, so things like services and resources. And we provide advice um, to the sector as well. So I'm going to chat to you today about um, our unified web program. So our attempts to simplify our web estate for our users. Um, it was quite a lot, so, and we're fairly limited on time, so sorry if I rushed through, but do grab me afterwards if you have any questions. So what was the problem? Well, it was this. And this wasn't all of them. This was just a couple of them, or some of them. And in fact, we didn't really know how many we had um, out there as, a, as an organization. Um, this is because of how we grew as an organization. We used to be very disparate. Um, we funded lots of different organizations. Those organizations ran projects. Those organizations ran services. And every one of those had at least one website, if not a couple, and a Moodle, and a blog. So the first issue here was the user experience. Um, every one of these had a different user experience. Um, some of them were great, some of them maybe not so much. They were built on shoestrings. But even the great ones, every time someone was moving from site to site, they were having to learn uh, a new interface. The next issue was silos. We had, um, for example, with this question, we had about three websites that would have answered it uh, in different ways. But we were asking our users to understand us, to understand our complexity, and to really put effort in to, to try and find the stuff they were looking for. Something that we get quite a lot, or we got quite a lot when we did user testing, um, when we were testing gist.ac.uk, the site that, that we were looking after, was we would ask them a couple of warm-up questions just in terms of what services they used, um, if they're working in a library or an IT service. And they were often surprised when they found out that those services they used belonged to JISC. And it's not surprising when you looked back at the variety of those sites that people didn't really recognize that they were all from the same organization. And there was an issue of cost. Every one of those sites had to be developed. Um, everyone had ongoing hosting costs, domain name costs, um, and you'd hope they also had maintenance and design costs. Where they didn't have maintenance costs, then obviously you've got a security issue. Um, some of those sites were set up for a particular project. There was a budget there to start the site, and no budget set aside to keep those sites running, to keep those sites patched. So you had a security risk, you had a reputational risk. And then the final issue was our control extended this far. So we had to do something. So it's time to get persuading. So we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to build a platform, or we wanted to build um, we wanted to simplify, rather, the web estate for our users. Um, we wanted to reduce the number of sites, and for those sites that needed to be different or separate, we wanted to bring consistency in the user experience to them. So we started speaking to a lot of people. Um, there was an opportunity in that the organization was going through a big restructure. We, we were going from being this very disparate organization to becoming far more consolidated. Just recognized that as universities and institutions were starting to be asked to pay for us, they needed to understand who we were. And so this consolidation was happening and it was the right opportunity to start speaking to senior leadership and saying, we think there's a problem. We also think we know what the solution might be here. So we were invited to the management board meeting, but before we went, we had some very good advice um, from our um, manager, which is that we went to speak to everyone on the management board individually, one by one, to talk them through the process, including the CEO. And with each of them, they all had different aspects that they were most interested in. When we showed them slides like that, whether it was the security, whether it was the cost, whether it was the user experience. We took it to the management board and it went through fantastically. So now we needed to talk to everyone else. Um, so we did an all group webinar because this was gonna to touch on a lot of people's lives. And as I said before, there was uncertainty. We didn't know how many sites were out there. The organization, as I said, was incredibly disparate. There were pockets of development, there were pockets of, of site management across the, the whole organization. So we did the webinar to tell people what we were thinking and to invite them to a web family meeting. So something where we could just bring together all these people that we'd never met before, or rarely met before, um, to talk through what the ideas were and to see what their thoughts were about them. So the first stage of the project proper was around assessment, to actually understand what was out there. 
Now, we had a feeling as to how we wanted this to go, but when we took it to the web um, family meeting, it was agreed that it should actually be an independent um, agency doing this. So we brought in someone outside to, to come in and have a look at this. We also wanted to make sure the organisation didn't feel like it was being done to. Um, there was a definite risk with that. So we set up an assessment panel. That panel was made up with people from across the organisation and we didn't pick easy people either. We pe picked people who were going to challenge us. And the value of that was that when they were happy, it meant the people in their directorates were happy. Um, so it didn't feel necessarily like it was a, a us just telling people what was going to happen. And we had one single criteria for the agency when they started work, was simply that the UX should be maintained or improved. Now we were confident that within that, things like the cost would be reduced, things like the complexity would be reduced, things, all the stuff that, that were raised as problems before, but we wanted to just try and keep it as straightforward as possible um, for when we were discussing this. So in terms of the assessment, there were four criteria that the agency came up with when we were talking through it with them. Now the first idea was that things should be integrated. So by default, things should be moved on to gist.ac.uk. And the idea being that there should be one home to find things, it's easier to promote the stuff, it's easier to discover stuff when, you're, when you know exactly where it's going. But we recognised that some of the services wouldn't necessarily fit into that model, and we needed to give them a bit more space, we needed to perhaps give them the whole user interface, but we still wanted to people, to people to feel comfortable as to what they were doing and where they were. So the idea of the service mode site came in, with a still a JISC feel in terms of typography, colour, look. Um, basically trying to, to move towards something like the BBC model with lots of individual sites, but the, as you move through them as a user, you wouldn't really notice. We also recognised that there was a need for what we called an associate site. So these are sites which either contractually or, or just sensibly we couldn't brand as ours. So it may just be that we were a minor partner, or it might be that as an organisation or as a, as a service, it needed to be independent from JISC. So we had that as the third criteria. And finally, we knew that there were some sites out there that were really redundant, that, that had perhaps been around for a particular project, um, and that project had ended a couple of years ago, and they were still sat there, so those could be archived um, and then closed down. So in terms of the outcome, they suggested that we focus on 101 sites. Um, I'm not sure why they didn't, couldn't quite manage to get it into a nice round number, but there you go. Um, so 45 to be uh, integrated, 25 service modes, 17 associate sites, and 10 that they suggested were redundant. And the panel saw through these um, recommendations and agreed with them, and we took them to senior management and they agreed as well. We also took the, the recommendations in priority order and asked them, is this the right order that we should be tackling these things with? There was a bit of tweaking, but we were then ready to start. In terms of lessons learnt, I think involving everyone was the key thing. Right from the beginning, we knew that there were lots of people out there who this had involved, so we needed to talk to everyone. Or at least, give, at least give people the opportunity to talk back. Also getting the outside vo voice was critical. I think we've heard that quite a few times, that actually having someone outside come in and tell people the thing that you already have been saying for a while, it really helps. Um, the cross-organisational panel was fantastic in terms of giving it uh, credence within the organisation and that clear single criteria was very helpful in terms of communicating. The one thing we could have done to improve it was to keep that panel going. Um, throughout the process, I think we missed a trick by, by saying, thanks very much, you've done your job, right, we're going to move on now. So the next two pieces of work were the integrations and the consistency, the visual consistency. So we'll, they both ran in parallel, but let's look at the integrations first. So the way we did it is fairly straightforward. We involved the relevant teams right from the beginning. Um, there was definitely a worry that things would be done to people. Um, it was an incredibly sensitive time in the organisation because um, along with the restructure, some people were losing jobs. Um, parts of the organisation were being closed down. So it was, it was a very difficult time to be dealing with anyone, especially around something sensitive like we're talking about your content. Um, one of the things we did was make sure absolutely that they recognised they were still the content owners that we might be moving it onto gist.ac.uk, but that wasn't going to change. The other thing which you may have noticed is the language we used. So um, we were very careful right at the beginning to talk about language um, as a team and recognise that you know, there was a default of saying things like, oh, the core website or the main website. And obviously that's quite insensitive when you're talking to someone about moving content. So we made a very concerted effort that whenever we refer to it, it would always be moving content onto gist.ac.uk. 
So the next step was the audit, which if they had resource, then they did it. So looking at the content that was going to move on to gist.ac.uk, looking at their analytics, being really quite hard-nosed as to what made sense to come across and also what could be supported in the future. Um, but also functionality that needed to come across. And then they put together a proposal. Or, if they didn't have the resource there, then that was done by our team. Um, through this process, we had a team of three content editors also, who also had to do business as usual. And this process lasted about 18 months. Um, we then looked to refresh and migrate the content across, communicate to users, and then redirect. And over those uh, 18 months, we integrated or archived 44 um, services. Um, so there are 11 outstanding, which we have uh, a plan for, um, and that's, that's continuing, but there are 44 in that process. So how could we have improved things? What things went well? Well, talking, um, just being very open, um, making sure that when people started to talk to us, because people did, because they were nervous about what was going on, they heard about it, that we were responding. Um, the language that we use, so as, as I said, things like just to ACDK, just small things, but I think they did help. Using the tools that are out there, so um, we had a lot of connection with the British Library, they were fantastically helpful uh, with helping us with the UK Web Archive, for example. Um, but also things like Site Improve, which really helped to just look through the content before we brought it on. Really sort of brute force stuff. Get help. Um, Richard very kindly was running a Bath Content Strategy Camp, or Bath Content Strategy at the time, and um, ran a session with Christina Halverson, who is a guru when it comes to content strategy. So I was able to go along to that and just ask her a few questions at the end about how she might tackle this. So look for opportunities of where you can get help. I'm also aware of just the number of people in this room who, if you drop them an email, they probably would help them in terms of other talkers who talk through stuff like this, and likewise myself now. Um, and the other thing is just take this opportunity to create the inventory. If you're moving the content across, um, if you don't already have an inventory, then just start building an inventory of your site because you're going to have to do it at some point and it makes sense to do it now. So how could we have improved things? We could have talked more, much more. We could have been more available. We could have answered emails faster when people were worried. Um, I also think we could have communicated outwards more. We really wanted to blog whilst we were going through this and tell people what the running total was, tell people what sites had gone really well, sort of highlight the teams that had done fantastic work with us. Um, all the stuff that you see GDS doing. Um, in the end, it was just about time, but I'd have loved it if we could have done that. Um, the other thing was money. We were aware that, that we were making cost savings for the organization, and that was going to be an important key thing later. Um, however, finding out getting that information as to how much was being spent on those sites originally was very difficult, not least because of the sensitivities of how things were going, and not least because of the disparate nature of the organization in that we weren't really sometimes the owner of that content or that information. Um, it would have been great to have, but it was very difficult to get hold of. I think also publishing our principles. Um, one of the things we had was, one of the struggles that we had was around links. And we went into this process with a very clear set of ideals that, that no link would be left behind, that the links would persist in terms of content that was moved, then it would be directed either to the content that was being moved onto the site or onto a UK web, web, archive, web archive where the content would sit. And we had a lot of resistance from, from the people who'd be involved in that process saying, you know, that's, that's too much, that's, that's too much work, we, we can't do that. I think if we published the principle and explained why I'm there and built some momentum around that idea, I think it would have been easier to have those conversations and perhaps win some more battles. And lastly, just don't let people move and sort. It's that thing of moving house. It's like, we'll, we'll put it onto your website, we'll look at it later, and obviously that's just setting aside huge amounts of work for you in the future. So the next thing was the consistency project. So we had sort of a starting bit, the quickish wins. Um, when we first talked about bringing a consistent look to all of our web estate that was going to remain out, um, one of our um, senior managers said, that's great, can you do it in about two months? Because that's how long you've got. So we sort of sat down with her and found out what, exactly what the issue was that she was worried about. And it was absolutely about this idea of organizations who were about to be asked to, be, uh, to pay for GIST, not knowing that they were using GIST services. So we thought, well, there's probably some simpler things we could do to start with. So we created a banner that went across um, all the sites that were sat out, out of just at UK. Um, I think we spent too much time on it, actually. We did a really nice banner that when you clicked on it, it dropped down and told you a little bit about JISC and sort of listed a couple of things in terms of other services you might be interested in. It told you where in the sort of estate of JISC you were in. It, 
it was very nice. It followed the Mozilla sort of look and feel in terms of the little drop down. It was, it was great fun. However, it took a lot of time. And actually, what we could have done is just a black banner with a GIST logo that linked through the GIST, to GIST.ac.uk, and we'd have been able to start on the other stuff a bit sooner. We weren't really clued into MVP at that point. The other thing was subdomains, and I think it's a really powerful way to give, um, to, to make it clear as to where your site's sitting in terms of ownership. However, it was very difficult for the teams involved, um, but it's something that's, that's going along, and certainly new sites all will be on .gist.ac.uk, as well as other sites moving on as time goes on. So then the big bit about consistency was the creation of a pattern library. So our idea was to create a, uh, a code library um, for the organization um, that was run by CDN, and that would allow developers to, to pick code blocks that would create um, nice uh, user interface elements that would be consistent across the state um, and make things look great for our users and be easier for our, for our developers. Um, the issue was this was around the amount of time it took. Um, I, I'll, I'll come on to that in a second actually. In terms of the consistency, um, the results that we got, well as you can see it's very much skewed towards the stuff that's still in development and I think that's the problem with stuff around these, these issues. We have 10 sites that are in, de in development that are looking at the, the consistency, we've got four, four that are live and alpha beta stage and we've got three that are live services. Um, we have also got Angular UI um, directives that have been created by the community and a WordPress theme that has been created by the community. In terms of the issue with the pattern library, however, is that it requires huge long-term support, both from the community and from senior management. Um, and that's something that's just moved on. Um, the business focus has shifted and so has ours has to as well. Um, instead, we've moved away from the pattern library, which will still be used by those sites, um, towards UX support and advice. So using the, the UX thought that's gone into the creation of the pattern library um, into advising people how to do it and allowing them to find their own routes. As I said, things like the WordPress theme has come about, have come about, which has made things uh, very easy for people to start creating sites. But in terms of the pattern library itself, it, because of the amount of, of support it needs ongoing, it's just come, it's on hold at the moment. So how can we improve things and um, keep up with our users? When we first started the research around this, uh, our users were um, back-end and front-end developers, so that we were able to um, so, we, so the, the, the patent library was, was built around them. By the time the patent library launched, the organization shifted to using far more uh, external developers who weren't particularly interested in front-end, who were used to using things like Bootstrap. And so there, there was resistance there about using it. But where perfectionism? When working with developers, anyway, there's an element of wanting to get it perfect. When you're working with a developer who's developing something for another developer that they'll see and pull, pull apart, I think that, that just gets doubled. Um, Pattern blindness, you know, these things you may be looking at for ages, but other people won't be. Use your community, get stuff out there, and this is the thing about momentum. You need to build momentum about this before the organization realizes why it's a good investment, and I think that's where we, we didn't quite get there. So overall, our aim was to improve the user experience um, of our users by simplifying our web estate. We've done that to a greater extent. We have, we've reduced the number of sites greatly. Um, we've started to see consistency across the, the sites that are, that are going out there. Um, but I think the, the routes we took, maybe we could have done differently. So I think it's possible if you're pragmatic, if you shift when you realize that things aren't working. You need a lot of support from the top and the bottom. And you need to communicate, and that's not just talking, but you need to show stuff. You need to show things that people can use. And you need to build communities, not least to protect your work, so that people, um, so that, that you know, this isn't just a project that runs and then stops, but rather that, that runs and runs and runs. And in the end, the way we've done that is we still don't have teeth. We still have that, that small sort of circle of responsibility. However, we've started creating policies and brought in committees or little policy groups um, from across the organization. So again, it's that idea of, although we don't have the, the teeth to tell people that, because they're invested in it, they feel like they need to behave. They need to do these things the, the, the way sort of that's best for the whole organization. And that's worked really nicely. Just quickly chat around um, organizational change. So you've seen this once already, but I thought it was an interesting thing just to quickly um, jump into. So this is the Cotter model of organizational change. Um, create urgency, well, we had that right at the beginning in the fact that the organization had a shift. The organization had to change, had, it was changing, and it needed to, to communicate to its users 
what services they were already using, for example. Um, so that urgency was fantastic in terms of being able to get something done that we knew was a proper issue. A guiding coalition. Well, that was those conversations with the senior managers. That was then the conversations with the, um, the, the, the wider web teams and the panels that we used. It's getting the expertise of the people from across the organisation, making them feel like it's part of something they're de developing, part of something they're thinking about. The vision initiative we had and we developed as we went along and we listed volunteers. You know, throughout this process we were using people in the organisation to do this. And to an extent we were removing barriers. But I think where we started to come unstuck with short-term wins. So with integration that was much easier. It was much easier to show, well we've now integrated this many sites or this many sites. With the panel library, it was much harder because there's so much work that goes into it before anyone sees anything. And even when you're ready, you've then got to wait for the developers of the sites who are then using the panel libraries to be ready to launch. So you're, you're, you're very much sort of at their whims. So it's very hard to build that, that momentum around things, which makes it hard to sustain the acceleration around it. As it is, we're now in a situation where we have got quite a few sites coming out. There are sites already out that look like a GIST site now, as, the, you know, as people would describe them. Um, and there are more coming. But I think that it just came a little bit too late for the pattern library to be the solution people look for. Instead, it's now that people know how it should look and how it should operate, and that's how they're doing it. They're, they're finding their own ways to do it, which is perhaps in a way fine. Um, and proven in bed. Well, as I said, I think with things like the integrations, it would have been lovely if we'd had the, the financials behind them because actually the, that would have been told a, a fantastic story. I think we ha still have a great story in terms of the user experience, um, but, but I think it's just looking for all these opportunities as to, where, as to how you can prove what you're, you're doing is answering the problems you're looking um, that you sort of raised at the beginning. So that's it. I think I've galloped through it a little bit, but thank you very much.